Hello, everyone. Welcome to our online video series, Reading Hope in Trying Times. Our guest today is Brandon Robertson. Brandon is a noted author, activist, and pastor working at the intersection of spirituality and social renewal. He serves as the lead pastor of Mission Gathering Christian Church in San Diego and serves as the executive director of Metanoia. A prolific writer, he is the author of Nomad, A Spirituality for Traveling Light, True Inclusion, Becoming Communities of Radical Embrace, Gay and Christian, No Contradiction, The Gospel of Inclusion, A Christian Case for LGBT Plus Inclusion, the editor of Our Witness, The Unheard Stories of LGBT Plus Christians, and a contributing author to several additional books. He also writes regular, regularly for Patheos and his bylines in Time Magazine, Dallas Morning News, The Huffington Post, NBC, and The Washington Post. Brennan has been an honored speaker at renowned institutions like the White House, Oxford University, the U.S. Peace Corps headquarters, and the Parliament of the World Religions. He teaches seminars at San Francisco Theological Seminary and is a consultant and facilitator with Auburn Theological Seminary. He's a founding member of the Union of Affirming Christians and has served as a board member or advisor to the Democratic National Convention, Department of State, Department of Health and Human Services, Red Letter Christians, and the Humane Society. Brandon received his BA in Pastoral Ministry and Theology from Moody Bible Institute and his Master's of Theological Studies focused on sexual and gender justice from Iliff School of Theology. So Brandon, it's a really great to have you here. It's the first time we've had a chance to work together. And I really appreciate you joining us. Yeah, it's so good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, my, my pleasure. Um, maybe you can start by just sharing some of your thoughts on the uh, health crisis that we're going through, how it's impacting you, how you reflected on it. Yeah, these are crazy times. Um, I, I was just thinking this morning how back in January, I was traveling around and speaking and doing all that fun stuff that I normally do and never could have imagined that in just a few months, all of humanity would be forced to stop the way we were living. And um, I think obviously it was initially shocking. And I think obviously there's a lot of pain and suffering and we don't want to gloss over that. But I also do think that this has been a time for me of really getting a chance to reflect on the ways that I lived prior to COVID-19, the, the assumptions I had about the world, and this period of slowing down a little bit and being confined to a house for three months and, um, and being very local focused, which is not something I've been, even though I'm a pastor of a local church, I'm, I'm usually not super connected to my on the ground community in all the ways that I think I could or should be. And so this time has really been a, a lot of self-reflection. It's been a lot of dreaming about what the future looks like. And um, I also think that this has fundamentally changed um, the way church, for instance, will be done going forward as we've all adopted these new virtual platforms and technologies. I think um, our church has seen folks from all around the world tuning in on Sundays and joining our Wednesday prayer groups. And um, it's really, it's just such a unique moment to be living in that um, we're all being called back to kind of the basics and starting to think about what this new world we can create on the other side of post COVID-19 looks like. Um, and so I honestly, um, it's ironic to say that I feel pretty good in this time, but I, I do. I, I had the virus early on, uh, recovered from it, and um, have, yeah, just been taking this time to both care for those that are struggling in my community, but also refine and use this time well to prepare for life after. I did not realize that you had had the virus. Uh, how did that experience go for you? Yeah, it was, um, I had tr was on a book tour in Europe in February, and I was in uh, England, Switzerland, and France, right when the virus was starting to emerge there. Um, and so I came back home, and then early March, I just started getting symptoms. It wasn't horrible. Um, I have bad allergies, and I thought that's what was happening. Um, and I even posted on Facebook, like, the day that it was happening um, for the first time that I noticed it. And I said, why are allergies so bad in San Diego? And people were giving me all these recommendations for medicine. Um, and then the next day I woke up and I just felt really pretty terrible. Called the doctor, couldn't get tested. They wouldn't test me because I was too young. Um, and they basically just said, 
stay at home, stay in bed, and see what happens. And so I did that, and for the next two weeks, basically laid in bed and went through it. It wasn't horrible for me, um, as I've heard it is for so many other people, and recovered on the other side of it, and have been good ever since. So I'm truly lucky to not have had one of those really horrible experiences we've heard about. And um, yeah, I lived well, through it. Is, so. Two weeks is a long time to be in bed, but uh, I'm glad that yeah. that's all it was for you. Yeah, totally. So I've talked to folks from lots of other locations, but I haven't talked to anybody from San Diego, just kind of in terms of what the virus impact is like, generally speaking, there. Yeah, it's uh, San Diego. Well, first of all, I'll say I'm new to California. I've only been here three years and I'm really grateful to be living in California during this moment. Um, not just for political reasons or anything like that, but I, we really do function kind of like a different country compared to the rest of the United States. And um, I think the leadership of our local leaders, our governor has been really quite tremendous. And so San Diego's not been very hard hit by this. I mean, we've had a couple thousand people um, end up in ICU, many of those dying. Obviously, that's horrible. But um, like my own church community, we've seen folks get sick but recover fairly quickly. Um, and people are really adhering to the social distancing guidelines. Um, I went out to the park for the first time uh, two days ago and yeah, just watching people even going out and about now that parks are open, but wearing our masks and standing six feet apart, it's, it, it was good to see and encouraging, and I hope we can keep it up so that hopefully we can get back to some normal rhythm of life soon. Yeah, well, I mean, what are your thoughts on what we'll end up taking away from all of this? I know it's a little bit early to, you know, kind of reflect on something that we're in the middle of right now, but uh, do you have any thoughts yet along those lines? Yeah, um, I just was like 10 minutes before we got on uh, the call today, um, was talking with a publisher about writing a book on what life after COVID looks like. So I've been thinking about this for the past couple of weeks. Um, and I really, there are things that I hope happen, um, and I'm not sure that they will, um, but I've been hesitant to try to ascribe meaning or describe what's happening with uh, theology. but there is one thing that just seems overwhelmingly clear to me, and it's that whether we believe in God as a very personal God or kind of the universe as a big kind of intelligent being, whatever it is, I think something is trying to communicate with us that the way we are living and the way we were living is not sustainable and will result in this kind of death and destruction that we're seeing right now. And it's giving us a chance to reset. It's giving us a chance to say, look, the earth can actually heal really quickly, actually. Uh, Los Angeles' skies can become clear in the matter of a week. Um, Hong Kong skies become clear in the matter of a week. Um, we see carbon emissions going down because airplanes are now out of the sky. 98% of the travel is cut. Um, we're seeing all of this, and we're seeing all the things that we were told weren't possible or that we didn't believe were possible can be done actually in the snap of a finger. Um, even things like, not to get too political, but healthcare can be extended to every American. Uh, the government can uh, fund those who don't have jobs or money and find themselves in hard times like that. Obviously there are repercussions and things like that, but just the realities um, that we didn't think were possible have emerged. And my hope is that as we move forward, we don't try to go back to normal, but that we realize virtual reality is going to be the way that we're going to exist and we need to exist for the foreseeable future. Um, because this, conferences this way, having conversations this way, will cut down on all the things that are destroying our planet. Um, and also, uh, I was talking to David Gushy earlier this morning and he said, flying in airplanes is also just really bad for your health. They're incubators for viruses. like." We need to be thinking about what it looks like on the other side of this to live more locally, to live more simply, to live more virtually. Um, and that's not to say, uh, of course, we all want physical connection. Of course, when you host your next writing conference, I want to be there in person. But I think there is just really important lessons if we can wake up to them and be wise enough to recognize them. 
and I'm not sure that we can and that we will. I'm quite cynical about uh, humanity's ability to not just try to return to the consumer way we were living before. But if we can manage to at least, even in incrementally, take some of these lessons forward, um, I really think we've got a shot at, it sounds grandiose, but saving the planet from destruction and saving our species from the destruction that we are headed towards. Um, and in that sense, there is a spark of gratitude for this moment and the ability for us to, for so many of us to have a moment to reflect and to begin to think of a new way forward. I just couldn't agree with you more on, on many of the things you just said, Brandon. Um, you know, my perception of how God supports us is that, you know, God's not causing this to happen. It's not like, you know, aimed at you or me or anybody else. It's part of life, right? It's part of the world that we live in. Uh, well, the way God supports us is the, what do we do about it? What do we do next? You know, what, what do we choose to do? And um, as you said, the impact of the environment in a positive way without all of the travel and commuting and everything has been pretty dramatic already after a very short period of time compared to the decades and centuries of abuse. Um, and uh, I, in my previous life, spent a lot of time in Asia, you know, because I was in high tech. So I spent a lot of time in long flights uh, over the ocean. And, uh, you know, as you said, it's like, uh, what my experience was about half the time I came back sick, you know, after, after doing that. So, um, you know, the, and, 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 you know, we've got this technology now to do things like you and I are doing today that didn't exist at least in very, uh, acceptable forms until recently. So what an opportunity. And, and, and oh, by the way, what you just said about healthcare too, you know, what an opportunity that we have to realize some of these things to take advantage of some of these things that we have not done so. Um, so I agree with you, I'm very hopeful, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Totally. <laughs> yeah. So um, one of the th topics we've been discussing in these interviews is basically how God has supported us in challenging times in the past and how we've been able to draw on that now. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Obviously, I think for me, my understanding of God has dramatically changed in different seasons of life um, throughout my faith journey. But I mean, the reason I became a Christian back when I was 12 years old was through a fundamentalist Baptist church and kind of the stereotypical conversion experience going down an aisle as they're singing just as I am and giving your life to Christ. As I might understand salvation differently now than I did then, but what was happening then was what I still believe to this day, God breaking into a 12 year old's life who grew up, I lived in an abusive alcoholic family in a trailer park in Maryland and really um, by the age of 12 was mentally broken down, struggling with suicidal thoughts, um, having panic attacks every day. And I really had no clear trajectory for my life going forward. And it was in those moments that I had these profound, deeply experiential experiences with what I know as God um, that really comforted me, that gave me a sense that my life had purpose and that I could use it to create a better world for myself and for others. And that got me through this portion of my childhood that was really dark and grim and that I don't know that I would have gotten through otherwise. Um, and then really from then on till now, the other way that I've seen God um, working the most is through other people. Um, and in the same way that you're, what we're doing right now, I spend a lot of time in these kind of conversations with lots of people who have come into my life and just given me the support and the direction and the caution uh, that I needed when I needed it. And I'm always so grateful for the people that pop up in my life and speak the words that need to be spoken and give the direction that needs to be given. Um, and I really, I feel supported by God most in those moments. And then I think the last thing I'll say has been for the past couple years, I've started to experience God and through nature primarily. And um, meaning that when I go outside in the morning in my backyard and sit on my hammock and 
look up at the palm trees and the morning sun or the sunrise out my window at night, there's just this sense that because there is beauty, I can only imagine that the God who created us gave this to us for our pleasure. And that's such a benevolent um, thought to have, that there's a being that cares so much for us that they just created beauty so that we could experience it. Um, and that reminder of even in my deepest doubts and my darkest moments that there is good at work in the universe. Um, I feel like that's God's spirit gently keeping me afloat. And that's what's really been keeping me afloat in these times of social distancing as well. Very cool. Well, I think that kind of leads into my next question, which is, you know, what resources or spiritual practices <laughs> or books, yeah. you know, um, do you recommend for people to think about now? That's always an unfair question, especially in regards to books, because uh, <laughs> I, I, even over this, um, this time in COVID-19, I've probably bought 60 or 70 new books. Um, <laughs> You'd be both. I'm a, yeah. I'm one of these guys. I never read a book cover to cover, but I'll buy hundreds of books and read little portions of them. And um, I'll say this, what has been helping me before, when I came into COVID-19 this season, I, I thought, oh, I need to start getting disciplined. I've always wanted to be disciplined. Let me like set a routine. It's actually sort of embarrassing, but behind me, I bought this meditation pillow over here and all this stuff. I was committed to becoming the yogi that I always dreamed of becoming. And I've never sat on that meditation pillow since I bought it uh, <laughs> to meditate. Uh, but I had, a, I, I had a conversation with a writer named Thomas Moore um, about two months ago. And I asked him, I said, hey, how, do you, how have you been so disciplined? You've written 50 books. You're a, you were a monk. You're a spiritual teacher. You're all these amazing things, you had to have been disciplined. And he told to me, he looked at me and said, I've just chosen not to be disciplined in life. I've chosen to do the things that I enjoy. I've written the books because I enjoyed writing them. And if, if I was trying to be disciplined, I would have written only two books instead of the 40 I've written. And, <laughs> and in, in hearing him say that, there was like a click that has really been a spiritual shift for the past month and a half, where I've just said, I'm... I'm giving up all the expectations of the things I think I need to do. Um, and I'm just going to do what feels good. I've uh, naturally then started reading lots of Epicurean philosophy um, and just this idea that life is meant to be lived and enjoyed. So take time to do that and don't feel bad for it. And, um, and that's been super life giving and helpful to me over the past couple of months. Um, and so, I have this book that I've been reading that I actually, it's been like my Bible. It's called How to Be an Epicurean, uh, The Ancient Art of Living Well by Katherine Wilson. It's just been super helpful um, to me over these past couple months. It gives a little bit of a history of the Epicurean movement, but also um, it, it calls us to kind of an ethical Epicureanism because there's this, you can go to one extreme where you're just all about pleasure and it's super selfish and self-centered. And there's another way of doing this where yes, life is meant to be enjoyed, but you're also trying to maximize pleasure and enjoyment of other people, which then manifests as justice and ensuring people have basic needs and rights and things like that. Um, other than that, I've also, uh, my reading has gotten to, I've gotten into young adult fiction, which, I, I normally don't like fiction at all and I would never read it, but it's been a great escape from reality. Um, and some of these young adult writers um, out there today are, I think the best writers of our time and they're often uh, overlooked by so many of us serious folks. Um, so I read this book called, I Will Give You the Sun. Um, I forget the author's name, but just an incredible book that it's young adult, but also LGBT and just transported me away for a week. So I've been enjoying myself reading a lot. Um, and yeah, that's, that's been a great spiritual practice, honestly, is just keeping grounded by having a good time and not being too serious in this situation. Very cool. Well, self care, you know, I think has been important for a lot of people in various forms here. Yeah, totally. 
So Brandon, I want to thank you for uh, taking some time uh, to be with us. I know you have a very busy schedule uh, running a church and all the other things that you're doing. So thanks so much. Thank you so much. It's so good to be with you. Yeah, same here. Really glad we were introduced and uh, have been able to spend some time together. Likewise, likewise. All righty, take care. You too.